Hey, my friend, Adam here. And in this video, I'm gonna give you a system or a framework that you can follow step by step that's going to allow you to accomplish more in the next six to 12 months than most people will in 10 years, maybe even their entire lifetimes. Whether you want to start or grow a business, become a creator, or simply secure your future, the simple fact is there has never been a better time in history to do this. And you have everything you need to succeed right in front of you right now. What's missing though, and what stops 99% of people from taking advantage of this opportunity is a plan, a strategy, and a way to take all of the disconnected information out there and put it together in an easy to follow and easy to understand system. A system that can help you achieve all of your goals, no matter how big they are. And the first part to this system is understanding that the keystone piece of information that ties all of this together and is the answer and the secret to getting anything you want, achieving any goal that you have, and basically living a life that other people can only ever dream of all comes down to the concept of becoming a high value person. So let me show you how to do that now. First off, when I'm talking about becoming a high value person, I'm talking about it from the market's perspective. In other words, how much the market or society or the world is essentially willing to reward you in exchange for the value that you offer. This has nothing to do with your intrinsic value as a human being. You're awesome, I know that. But that doesn't mean that the market is willing to give you any kind of money yet. So let's fix that now. The secret is that you become a high value person based on the value that you provide to other people. It was Zig Ziglar that said, you can have everything in life you want if you will just help other people get what they want. And that's the key, helping other people get what they want. And when you do that, you become valuable. For example, I could just sit here alone in my office with all of this information about business and marketing and growing companies and building brands and just sit here alone and keep it to myself. But if I don't actively try to share that and help other people, then I'm not working to become a high value person. This is why it doesn't just matter what you know, but what you do with what you know. Another example. I was working on a video project last summer and I thought it would be interesting to try to learn to ride a unicycle. So after many, many failed attempts, well, riding a unicycle is now a skill that I have. But because nobody really cares, because I'm not using this skill to go out there and actively help anybody else, well, it doesn't make me a high value person and it doesn't make the skill all that valuable to have. Unless I wanna join the circus. But let me explain it another way by breaking down the rules that go into becoming a high value person. Three rules, each of which builds on each other, so you can see exactly how to make this happen for yourself. Number one, a high value person has skills that other people see as valuable. Being good at something isn't enough to make you valuable if it's something that nobody really cares about or doesn't help anyone but you, like riding a unicycle. On the other hand, having specific business and marketing skills is something that can benefit the lives and businesses of others. So therefore, it makes you more valuable. Which leads us to rule number two, which is that a high value person uses their valuable skills to help other people solve their problems. A skill that doesn't help someone solve a problem or accomplish a goal just isn't that valuable, at least insofar as the market is concerned. This is because helping people solve their problems with your skills is what makes them see you as valuable. And the more difficult or important their problem, the more valuable you become. Which is actually point number three, which is that a high value person uses those skills to help other people solve difficult, important problems. Problems that they haven't been able to solve themselves and problems that other people haven't been able to solve for them either. The more difficult the problem is to solve, the more you will be rewarded. The more important the problem is to someone, the more you will be rewarded. And the fewer other people out there who are able to solve this problem, the more you will be rewarded. What this means is that the high value person has skills that are rare, useful, and highly sought after, which allows them to offer these skills to who they want when they want and for whatever price that they want to charge, which is basically the definition of work freedom or at the very least doing work that you absolutely love and getting paid very well in return. So the next question then is how do you identify and then acquire these rare and useful and highly sought after skills? So let me walk you through that now. Have you ever heard of the 10,000 hour rule? It was made popular by Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers, and it essentially presents a pretty compelling argument on how it takes 10,000 hours of dedicated practice to achieve mastery. But like all things in life, this isn't always the case. And in fact, there are many situations and examples where this isn't the case at all. And you can replace the 10,000 hour rule with a far more reasonable and achievable 100 hours, which works out to two 50 hour work weeks. This is because mastery of an entire industry isn't required to become successful, certainly not initially. As what 
you want to focus on are those rare and useful and highly sought after skills, not the tens and hundreds and maybe even thousands of less valuable skills that aren't going to provide the same level of rewards. Let me give you an example now using marketing and putting the marketing industry right there at the very top, which admittedly probably does take a good 10,000 hours of solid study and practice in order to master all of the different fields involved. But below that, you also have each of these different subsets of marketing, things like paid ads and SEO and content marketing and branding and analytics and copywriting and so many more. Now, each of these probably also takes about a thousand hours of study and practice or more in order to achieve mastery in each different area, which in my opinion is still not a bad trade-off in order to learn one of the most profitable and valuable skills in the entire business world. But still, you can break this down one step further from there. Let's use paid ads for example. And rather than focusing on say all of the paid ads platforms like Facebook ads and Instagram ads and TikTok ads and YouTube ads, well, let's just say that you decide to focus on one in particular, maybe Google Google Ads. A valuable skill that's in high demand as millions of businesses around the world use Google Ads every single day, and a valuable skill that you can also learn for completely free, directly from Google and their Skillshop trainings. And a quick search for how long does Google Ads training take will show you that you can go through any of the trainings in about three to four hours each with total mastery taking up to about 100 hours or more. And with this skill, you could work as a freelancer, you could start a marketing agency, you could get a job with any number of businesses or companies out there. You can even work remotely, work from home or work from the beach and the earning potential, the income that you're able to generate from this skill set is virtually unlimited. The beauty though, is that you can also apply this 100 hour framework to basically any other skill or any other profession or any other thing that you can think of. Let me give you a personal example. For a long time, I've wanted to be able to make art, you know, like draw things and paint things and make stuff that doesn't look like an abomination and the fuel for many nightmares to come. But I had zero talent and zero aptitude for it. At least that's what I'd thought. And that's what I told myself for the better part of 30 years. But then I thought a little more carefully and a little more strategically about it. And I decided to apply this hundred hour framework to it. Starting at the top with say the 10,000 hours required to become a master artist and then breaking down into different subsets or different categories of art, say a thousand hours for drawing and a thousand hours for painting, maybe a thousand hours just studying light and form and shadow, but then breaking it down even further by say focusing on just painting in black and white and focusing on gradients and again, light and shadow. And then much, much to my surprise, after maybe only 30 to 40 hours of study and practice, well, I drew this sphere. I guess I painted the sphere. I'm still learning the art lingo, apparently. Then a sphere and a cube. Then a couple other random shapes. And a horse and a tree with an elephant. And every time it gets uh, just a little bit better. Not great, but better. Now, these aren't necessarily valuable or highly sought after skills. However, they did give me the perfect example of how you can achieve pretty much anything that you can think of, even things that you've always believed that you couldn't do. Where things start to get really exciting though is when you start to stack different skills on top of each other in something known as a skill stack. It's very, very original. So let me walk you through that now. In his book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big, the creator of the Dilbert comic strip, Scott Adams, talks about how creating a talent stack, becoming good at multiple skills, is a better success strategy for most people, rather than focusing on becoming world-class in a single skill. For example, Scott Adams created Dilbert because he was an okay artist, a reasonably funny writer, and had enough corporate experience to make writing jokes about that world easy enough. But he admits openly that he's not excellent in any one of those individual skills. Rather, it's their combination that makes him successful at what he does. And rather than trying to become perfect at something you're already pretty good at, you'd be much better off learning a new skill, which can open up new paths and opportunities that you didn't even know existed. Not only that, but what this means for you is that your unique opportunity, your competitive advantage, and your point of differentiation stands at the crossroads of your different skills and experience and perspective. Let me give you another personal example. One of the very first marketing skills that I ever learned was web design. But shortly after learning web design, I realized that nobody could find the websites that I was building. So I started to learn SEO. Then after getting a taste of that sweet, sweet free traffic, I decided I wanted more. So I started to learn about social media, and how to use it to generate clicks and leads, possibly even sales further down the road. This then led me to start learning about paid advertising on the social media platforms, specifically Facebook ads, which again, introduced me to an entire new world and an entire new way of doing marketing, as well as to many businesses and entrepreneurs who were spending millions and millions of dollars a year on ads. This then led me to start writing blog 
articles on the topic of advertising, which led to videos and to podcasting and to courses and consulting and coaching and public speaking and all kinds of other training and workshops. And ultimately getting to work with some of the biggest businesses and names in the game from Google to Facebook to Snapchat, Adobe, and many more. This is why billionaire entrepreneur Peter Thiel also advises that other entrepreneurs follow the three-step process of, number one, start small in an area where you have a competitive advantage. And like we've just discussed, you can create a competitive advantage by acquiring a high value skill. Number two, dominate that niche. And it's a whole lot easier to get some traction as a big fish in a small pond before moving into deeper waters. Then number three, which is to then scale to other niches. Use the success and confidence you've built from your first skill set to leapfrog you into other and possibly more profitable niches and areas. The simple fact is though, that whether it takes 10 hours or 10,000 hours to build your new super skill stack, you still need a way to find the time and the motivation and the focus in order to make all of this happen. And this is where the concept of monk mode comes into play. So let's talk about that now. I wish I could tell you that there was a real life limitless pill, something you could take that would instantly increase your motivation and focus and energy and memory. I mean, there's gonna be some side effects for sure, but no pain, no gain, right? The good news is, is that there is a scientifically proven way to increase your energy and focus and motivation and concentration and all of those good things associated with higher performance. The bad news though, is that it's not a quick fix, a brain hack or a pill that you can take. It's more of an attitude and a lifestyle change, a mindset, if you will. Now, some people call this a dopamine detox. Other people call it self-discipline, but I like the term monk mode and I like it for two reasons. First, the term monk brings up visions of dedication and commitment and sacrifice for something they believe in. So by adopting this attitude and embracing this identity, it makes it easier for me to stay on track. The robe though, I, I just wear for fun. In his book, The Alter Ego Effect, Todd Herman talks about the power of embracing your alter ego in order to tap into a new level of power and confidence. Think Clark Kent becoming Superman, or Bruce Wayne becoming Batman, or Tony Stark an Iron Man. Or for real life examples, think Kobe creating his Black Mamba alter ego, or Beyonce becoming Sasha Fierce. So feel free to do whatever works for you. If that means embracing the identity of a monk, a warrior, a Spartan, a CEO, a superhero, or a terrifying and highly venomous snake like Kobe did, then go for it. Next, I like the term mode because it symbolizes and signifies a stage, a, a phase, a setting, a switch. Something I can do temporarily rather than a full-time permanent change that requires me to give up all of my possessions, shave my head, and move into a monastery. In other words, monk mode isn't something that you do forever. It's a sprint. Something you do for weeks or maybe months, depending on your goals. On his blog, writer David Kane lays out four rules to monk mode that I find work pretty well. First, a commitment to do certain amounts of certain kinds of work. The key here is to be specific about what you wanna focus on and what you wanna get out of this all at the end. Next, a commitment to abstain from certain distractions or vices. We all have a vice, a guilty pleasure that draws us away from the things we wanna do and know we should be doing. For me, it's checking email or social media compulsively and maybe ice cream. So put those away, delete them from your phone or do whatever you gotta do. Next is definite rules for both of these things. I like setting times for these. In other words, saying I'll work for 90 minutes uninterrupted on my most important task first thing when I wake up, and then maybe I'll allow myself 10 to 15 minutes a day at the end of the day to quickly check social media to see what's going on. And lastly, a definite start and stop date. I'm a big fan of 90 day sprints here, but feel free to push it to six months or maybe even more if you're up for it. The big thing here is that if you do fall down or miss a day or two, just get right back to it and pick up where you left off. Countless studies have been done that show that a break or a lapse or some kind of mini failure in your habit streak isn't what kills it. Rather, it's all of the guilt and the self-doubt and the judgment that you place upon yourself after having lapsed that one single time that pretty much destroys your chances of future growth. In other words, slipping up on say your diet and eating a cookie is totally fine. But eating a cookie, calling yourself a failure and then polishing off two sleeves of Oreos while you cry alone in the pantry staring at your reflection in the toaster is not fine. I can do better, I'm, I mean, you can do better. And if you're looking for ideas on what skills to focus on and to make learning a priority, well, my suggestion is to focus on one of the most powerful and profitable skills of all time, 
marketing, which gives you the ability to start or grow any kind of business, to work remotely or from anywhere in the world, including the comfort of your own home, and to build a business and a life that you actually enjoy and love and look forward to waking up to. So to help you do that, I've linked up a video right here with some of my absolute best marketing strategies. So make sure to take a look at that now and I'll see you in there in just a second.